was shocked at everything, you know what I'm saying? Welcome to The Undercurrent, your source for grassroots news. I'm Lauren Windsor. In this show, we'll talk about the NDAA, the National Defense Authorization Act, specifically Section 1021. The NDAA is an annual bill that outlines Defense Department expenditures. The 2012 NDAA included Section 1021, which allows the federal government to arrest anyone, including American citizens, and hold them indefinitely without warrant or charges, a blatant violation of fundamental constitutional rights. A coalition of activists, journalists, and whistleblowers, led by author and war correspondent Chris Hedges, filed suit against President Obama over the 1021 provision. In May of 2012, Judge Catherine Forrest ruled 1021 unconstitutional and issued a temporary restraining order for the plaintiffs. The Obama administration immediately filed appeal and won a stay against Judge Forrest's injunction. On Wednesday, February 6, 2013, the Second Circuit Court of Appeals heard oral arguments in Hedges v. Obama. A lawyer for Senators Kelly Ayotte, Lindsey Graham, and John McCain defended the government's position in an amicus brief and in court. After the hearing, the plaintiffs held a press conference in Foley Square. It appears that there's been a deliberate conflation of the powers of indefinite detention under the authorization for use of military force from 2001, which allowed George Bush and company to go after terrorists. It had a very narrow uh, three classes of people that the AUMF uh, applies to. It's uh, people who participated or planned the 9-11 attacks, uh, members of Al-Qaeda or the Taliban. That's it. Very, very narrow. The government keeps claiming over and over again that the AUMF and NDAA are exactly the same, but 1021b2 does two things. It possibly retroactively legalizes the fact that they have been over broadly interpreting the AUMF for who knows how long, perhaps since 2001. It's a huge quagmire. Our case is potentially the latch on Pandora's box here. We threaten to expose the fact that possibly two administrations have been over broadly possibly illegally interpreting a law, the AUMF. What seems to me very clear is that the three senators who were uh, advising, who were arguing this, for the indefinite detention without charges of American citizens <laughs> against the Fifth Amendment is well described as an enemy of the Constitution of the United States. Your name, Chris? My name is Chris Hedges, <laughs> in the case Hedges versus Obama. He is the captain. He's the captain. We've undergone a corporate coup d'etat. There is no impediment left now to corporate power. And the corporate state understands that as the economy continues to deteriorate, as the effects of climate change, and we just bore the brunt of that with Hurricane Sandy, over $70 billion worth of damage kicks in, there will be inevitable blowback on a betrayed population. And what's happening in this court now is the last thin line of defense between protecting what is left of our anemic democracy and the imposition of a military state. Corporate state knows what it's doing. If the Congress had put in one small sentence saying that U.S. citizens were exempt from this legislation, we would all pack up and go home. But they will not. Because as Senator Graham pointed out, it is designed to detain U.S. citizens. And the bottom line is, as this unrest continues, the corporate state does not trust the police to protect them. It wants the ability to call in the military. I've covered the WikiLeaks release of JTF memoranda known as the Guantanamo Files and revolutions across the Middle East and North Africa. I've conducted hours of interviews with former Gitmo prison guards, detainees, defense lawyers, and human rights activists. For the last year, I've covered the U.S. investigation of WikiLeaks, and to date, I've published the only publicly available transcripts for the secret prosecution of Bradley Manning taking place at Fort Meade. Because of my work as a journalist, government contractors attempted to falsely link a group, which I helped found, whose only purpose is to support campaign finance reform in the United States to Al-Qaeda. I have actually been detained by the U.S. government a number of times where they denied me access to a lawyer, where they told me that I would maybe never even get a trial, where they actually threaten. When they talk about these things in a sort of abstract sense here in this court and they say it's only for enemies, well, they've actually called me a terrorist. I've had members of the U.S. Army detain me on U.S. soil. And actually, 
And I know that I'm not the only one. And, I, and if I had been a Muslim American in the last 10 years, I probably would have had it a lot worse for the last 10 years. But the point is that it's not an abstract thing. And what these people are fighting here today is one of the most important court cases that is happening in America right now. Senators McCain, Graham, and Ayotte had authored 1021. They were seeking to give clarification to the court over their wording of the clause, correct? Well, they weren't trying to clarify the wording. They were trying to say, look. Or give insight into their formulation of it, like what would... They're trying to say this is meant to follow the law of war under the authorization of Congress for the government to go into war in Afghanistan. It's not meant to cover journalists or anyone else. And we, we turn around and say, you know, we don't know what your motive is in Congress. We can only look at the law. And the law says whoever substantially supports these groups can be detained by the military. And the trial... And, and what does substantially mean? We don't know what substantially means. There's no definition. This is not a word that's used in the law very often because it's completely vague. You know, we don't detain people based on th this concept of, you know, have they done enough to warrant being put away? Speech is always protected. You know, if, if a thousand Arab Americans want to scream death to America in the public square, they're allowed to do it. Just because they may be associated with extremist groups doesn't give the government the right to detain them. And, and the government's saying, well, we have the right to detain speech that's not independent. This is a major threat to free speech, and I think your viewers you know, who respect free speech really need to be aware of that. Tell us about your participation in the Hedges case. Our participation stems from the fact that as one of the first whistleblowers after 9-11, I was deemed to be a traitor and a turncoat and a terrorist sympathizer. Um, and so I ended up going on to represent other whistleblowers who are now being tried under the Espionage Act and called enemies of the state. The interest we have in this lawsuit is that terms like that put us within the ambit, ambit of the NDAA's indefinite preventive detention provision. Your case with the NSA, what year did this take place? Well, it all began early in 2001, but the government actually put me under investigation in 2006, and then I was prosecuted and indicted in 2010 and charged with 10 felony counts, five under the Espionage Act. And that's a World War I statute designed to go after spies and not whistleblowers. So I was actually facing upwards of 35 years in prison for having spoken truth to power. I revealed and disclosed uh, government uh, wrongdoing illegalities, uh, including uh, the secret surveillance uh, warrantless wiretapping program, as well as massive multi-billion dollar fraud, waste, and abuse uh, that was being committed by the U.S. government. In your case with Lind, how long did that take to clear you of your charges? Well, that's a very interesting question. It took a number of years before they dismissed the criminal investigation, but then they referred me to the state bars in which I'm licensed as an attorney, and that is still pending 10 years later. So uh, could you quantify the amount of uh, physical, financial, emotional stress as a result of these charges just for exercising constitutional rights and obligations as a whistleblower? Sure. I think um, I can speak safely for Tom and myself and a number of other clients that it sends you on the verge of bankruptcy. You end up taking out a second mortgage on your house. It wrecks havoc on your family and your finances, and it ends up leaving you blacklisted so you're unemployed and unemployable when you had served your country for years and even decades. Can you tell us about your motivation for organizing the case? Oh, absolutely. Well, essentially, I was really afraid under the NDAA that I could be in trouble, that my international team could be in trouble simply for the fact of exercising our First Amendment rights and uh, trying to you know, support civil liberties and human rights. So um, I had been involved with supporting WikiLeaks and was also hosting live streaming panel discussions where we were interviewing revolutionaries. We were planning on having Hamas members and other, you know, quote, unsavory people or, or, or groups. Um, and the language of this law made me feel that I was very much in trouble, um, possibly. <laughs> so I decided to gather together a few people. Chris Hedges had filed, and I approached him to see if we could join. And then I basically tapped people I knew who were just as afraid or even more afraid than I was, and people who 
together we could all kind of, um, you know, it's basically help the court see the forest for the trees. You know, the war on terror has no geographic or temporal boundaries, and uh, even terrorism itself is not well defined. And with these new terms, associated forces, substantial support, independent journalism or act, uh, advocacy versus dependent, those are all undefined things. They've never been figured out in case law. Earlier, uh, it I should say earlier this year, is actually uh, late last year, in December, there was uh, an amendment introduced by uh, the Senate. Uh, Senators Dianne Feinstein and Mike Lee um, sought to clarify the NDAA so that it said very specifically that uh, nothing could be construed to deny constitutional rights or habeas corpus. What happened with that? Well, essentially, we put a lot of pressure on that process, and uh, people might be surprised to hear this, but we didn't want that amendment. The reason we didn't want that amendment is that it was unfortunately so poorly worded that it actually made things worse. Um, they really need to, to consult civil liberties attorneys before they write amendments like that, because I think that Feinstein, her MO was perfectly, it was great. She was trying to fix something. But the way that that amendment was worded was very dangerous. And I actually did talk to people on the House Armed Services Committee. Um, I've talked to people in Congress quite extensively over this. They agree with our stance, they agree with our case, and they were worried about the amendment as well, and they switched their votes. What motivated you to initiate this case? Well, uh, as a foreign correspondent, I uh, had spent significant time with uh, individuals or groups, including al-Qaeda, that are listed on the State Department terrorism list. There's no exemption for journalists. Uh, you know, when you're traveling with these groups, when you're uh, writing about these groups and presenting their viewpoints, uh, I know from having covered the conflicts in Central America in the early 80s uh, that you are branded as uh, a fifth columnist, as a sympathizer, as even a member of these groups. Uh, the Reagan administration regularly denounced reporters that were covering uh, the atrocities in El Salvador during the war where I was or in Nicaragua in the Contra War. Uh, so this gives it legal clout. They just don't uh, linguistically attack you as a terrorist, but now they can legally treat you as a terrorist. Have you personally been detained? I, I, overseas, yes. I've been detained by innumerable governments, including the United States government. Bradley Manning uh, was held in 2010. Uh, this law came about in 2011. Do you think that uh, the case of Bradley Manning, uh, th this law was written in order to justify their treatment of him? No. Uh, I think that uh, I think that this law uh, was written because the corporate state understands very well, given the continued economic disintegration, the effects of climate change, uh, that there will be some kind of blowback, some kind of instability, uh, and they want to put the military out on the streets uh, in order to uh, crush any kind of dissent or unrest. So you see this as like a, a pre-industrial system collapse maneuver? Post-industrial. Uh, I mean, this you know is... I'm saying a pre um, industrial age collapse, like uh, the industrial well, economy as we know it, the collapse sure, of it. I mean, uh, Pre-collapse, not pre-industrial, but pre-collapse. We're, we're already watching Greece, Portugal, Spain disintegrate. Um, this is a global system that's going down. Um, and uh, I think the government is trying to accrue to themselves as much power as possible to maintain control, even if that means putting the military on the streets. You can find more coverage of the events of February 6th in part two of this NDAA special. I'm Lauren Windsor. Thanks for watching. Get pulled in to the undercurrents.